If you could ask God for one gift that would change your life, what gift would you ask for? I'm Bob Jones, and I'm a pastor, and I've been living that calling for 41 years. And right now, I get to coach pastors in Alberta. Uh, my job description calls me an advanced coach. So it's kind of tailor-made for advanced church. I uh, like the word advanced. It's a, it's a good word. And I like your pastors, Derek and Chandra. And Pastor Jeremy's no slouch either. I've been coaching with Pastor Derek uh, twice a month uh, since October. And I've really come to appreciate Derek and Chandra. Um, I know that Chandra is a great cook. And Derek is actually one of the best communicators that I know. Now, that's not flattery. That's fact. Derek convinced Chandra to marry him. Enough said, right? Derek, I said to him a couple of times, anything I can do for you, just ask. So he called and said, could you do a message on May 23rd? So I said, sure. So here I am recording this message, and it's actually my birthday. When you get to be as old as I am, you're just happy that you can remember that it's your birthday. I, I'm quite content with everything I have, so I don't need any gifts. I actually like to give gifts to other people on my birthday. And I hope that you would see this message as a gift to you, as, as a word of encouragement, even as a word of prophecy. On February 14th, uh, 2014, uh, Francis Chan gave a message to pastors, and he asked them this question. What would your church do if your building was gone? Could you still make disciples? Now that was seven years ago, and he had no idea that we were going to be facing a pandemic. But that's exactly the kind of thing that we've been facing for the last 15 months, where people have been unable to go to church, or capacity has been limited in our churches, and, and it kind of feels like the church is gone. And especially for you, Advanced Church, that's been your journey for a long time. You're still looking for a facility that you can call home. I know that uh, Derek and Pastor Jeremy have been sharing a series of messages called, Did God Say That? Um, or God Didn't Say That? Uh, I've been following the series, and, and I like the content, and I'd like to actually add on one thing. Uh, Jesus didn't say, gather every Sunday for three songs and a sermon. You won't find that anywhere in the Gospels. However, it is interesting that for some pastors during this pandemic, it seems as though that's almost the 11th commandment, just by the way that they've been reacting and responding. Um, I believe that the greatest threat to the church isn't external limitations on our gathering, it's the internal limits that we put on our going. You see, Jesus never commanded his disciples to gather. You won't find that anywhere in the Gospels. But very clearly, Jesus did command his disciples to go. And in some ways, this pandemic may have actually just saved the church. That it forced us online, it forced us into social media, it forced us to make changes where we didn't want to make changes before. Uh, it caused us to become creative and innovative, and best of all, it forced us back down to real, raw mission. And before things start to open up again, this is a wonderful time to imagine how we can accomplish God's mission. Advanced Church, I believe that God has put an open door before you. Open doors are like opportunities, and uh, oft times, opportunities are disguised as adversities. It makes them look complex. But I do know this, that when you see an opportunity, you should seize the opportunity. Just say yes, and then figure out how to do it and how to pay for it. The opportunities that we face and that are in front of you are significant. Um, that open door, you know, every door has two sides, faithfulness and fruitfulness. And if you will go out in faithfulness, you will come in with fruitfulness. And God's open doors always lead to souls. That's the cool thing. You say, Pastor Bob, how do you know that there's an open door in front of us? Well, Jesus said this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them everything that I have commanded you. That's Jesus' words to us. That's what Jesus says. You know, the mission statement of every church is pretty simple. You don't need a $10,000 consultant to come in and tell you. It's simply four words. Go, 
and make disciples. That's what Jesus says. Do you remember ever playing a game when you were kids uh, called Simon Says? It's a pretty simple game. There, there's no app for it. Simon says something, you do it, right? Simon says, pat your head, and you pat your head. Now, it's a whole different thing what Jesus says in the church. It's really a whole different game, and it's kind of weird. In the church, when Jesus says something, you don't have to do it. You just have to memorize it. Or, or study it, or even learn it in the original language, right? Jesus says, go and make disciples. Uh, how many people in our churches are actually making disciples? It's kind of weird, right? That's what Jesus says. So our two boys, Corey and John Mark, when they were growing up, uh, we would say to them, um, please go and clean your rooms. Now, they didn't come back two hours later and say, we memorize what you said, Dad. Corey, you said, go and clean your room. And John Mark didn't tell me, I can say that in Greek. And we're going to bring some friends over, and we're going to have a study, and we're going to actually see what would happen if we cleaned our rooms. They didn't say that. They knew better than to do that, right? They just went and cleaned their rooms. Jesus says, go and make disciples. It's pretty simple. It's scriptural. So what should we do? Well, start making disciples. And, and to start, you need to know what a disciple is. First of all, a disciple isn't somebody who has everything under control. A disciple isn't somebody who knows a lot of stuff about the Bible. A disciple is simply someone who revises their affairs to follow through with their commitment to follow after Jesus. A disciple asks themselves three questions regularly, if not daily. And here's the adventure of what it is to be a Christian. A disciple asks themselves the question, what is God saying to me? How is he getting my attention? And what am I going to do about it? What's God saying? How is he getting my attention? And what am I going to do about it? You know, today is celebrated in church world as Pentecost Sunday. And I'm going to share with you from uh, the New Testament um, a story about the first day of Pentecost. It occurred 2,000 years ago, and it was on that day that the disciples changed from living by their own personal preferences to living on God's purpose. There was a huge change. And I'm going to read to you from what's known as the Book of Acts. The, the full title of that part of the Bible is The Acts of the Holy Spirit. It was actually written by a man by the name of Luke. He's the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke. In fact, uh, the Gospel of Luke and Acts are like part one and part two of the same story. It's a continuation. And in Acts chapter one, Luke says, In my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Let me take you back to the question I started with. If you could ask God for one gift that would change your life, what gift would you ask for? Luke goes on to record what happened that day. Jesus said, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now notice what happens next, right after Jesus says this. You would think that the disciples may ask him about the Holy Spirit, what that experience might be like, what was going to happen to them. But this is what happens. Luke records, the disciples gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They weren't listening. What a crazy question to ask. They wanted to know if he thought that they were going to return to what they thought was normal. That if they were get to the point where the Messiah, who Jesus clearly was, 
the Jews expected a Messiah to come and he would be a deliverer for them and Jesus was even better than what they expected. They saw him die and then they saw him raised from the dead, that he was alive. And so now they were wanting to do the things that messiahs do. They were expecting him to bring on the normal that they anticipated. They expected him to free them from the Romans, their oppressors, and that he would deliver the kingdom to them. Um, it's interesting. They were focused on what they preferred as their normal. They were focused on their own preconceptions. Jesus didn't want them to go to their normal. He wanted them to go to his normal. You know, I've heard a lot of conversations, and I'm sure you have, that so many people are looking forward to getting back to normal. What if God doesn't want us to return to our old normal? Luke continues in his writing in Acts. Um, Jesus says to them in answer to their question, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. You know, there's a lot of Christian teachers today who are saying that we're living in the end times, that these are the last days. Just look at what's happening in the Middle East. Look at what's happening in Israel and in Gaza. And, and these are the signs that this is the moment when Jesus will reestablish his kingdom and that, that he would return. I go back to that uh, recording in the book of Acts. The disciples we're inclined to ask the wrong questions, just like those disciples. And, and the questions about what's going to happen next and the things that we may think should happen are, are not necessarily the things that God wants for his disciples to be able to focus on and to be able to do. Because here's what Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what Jesus is saying to Advanced Church today is, you will be my witnesses in Calgary and in Alberta and in Canada and to the ends of the earth. That's the open door in front of you. That's the opportunity in this moment to be able to be seized. Luke uh, actually fleshes out the whole experience of what Jesus was saying to his disciples. You have to go back to his gospel in chapter 24 uh, and in verse 46. Jesus says, the forgiveness of sins will be preached in my name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. The disciples had no idea that 10 days after Jesus said that, when the day of Pentecost had come, that that would be the day that they would experience what Jesus had promised to them, that they would experience the gift that God would give to them. But they were in the right place at the right time because they did exactly what Jesus asked them to do. They waited. And God's speaking to you today about your moment in your life. And I believe that you're in the right place at the right time watching this message today and being a part of Advanced Church and fulfilling what God would have you for uh, do in the city of Calgary. The Bible records in Acts, chap in Acts chapter 2 verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the entire house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, was there that day. Peter was a disciple. And I think he asked himself three questions. What's God saying? How's he getting my attention? And what am I going to do with this? Well, what God was saying was, this is that. This is what Jesus promised. This is the gift that the Heavenly Father was giving. Getting his attention? <laughs> How could you not get your attention with the sound of a roaring wind and tongues of fire settling on your friends' heads? And then, what am I going to do about it? Peter said, I'm going to do what Jesus said. I'm going to be a witness for Jesus. I'm going to speak up. And that's exactly what he did. In verse 14 of Acts chapter 2, Peter stood up, raised his voice, and he addressed the crowd. Now, this crowd was interesting. 
the day of Pentecost was a feast time for Jews, and they were encouraged to come back from around the world and be in Jerusalem. There was probably about a million people that had gathered in Jerusalem for what was called the Feast of Weeks, and then the day of Pentecost. And it was these individuals that heard this commotion going on by these 120 people in this upper room. And they had come to find out what was going on. Some actually thought that the disciples were drunk, that there was no other explanation for what they were doing. Some of them heard the disciples declaring the wonders of God in their own language. And so Peter addresses that. And he says, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, even on my servants, men and women. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God, I love that, but God. Whenever you have but God, always something good's coming after that. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of this. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and he has poured out now what you see and what you hear. The day of Pentecost was when this little group of 120 disciples who followed a rabbi from Nazareth, who died and was raised from the dead, and suddenly the church breaks forth. And as people listened to Peter, that day 3,000 people decided to believe on Jesus. They became converts, followers of Jesus. And a few days later, 2,000 more were added to their number. Just think about that, 120 to 5,000 in about a week. That's an incredible response, and the church continues to break forth everywhere that the name of Jesus is shared. It breaks forth in Calgary. That's why Advanced Church exists. You are something that has been going on for 2,000 years from God's heart into our communities. The ability to share the forgiveness that comes through Jesus. The ability, just like the disciples in the book of Acts, to be filled with the Holy Spirit and then to be able to ask God, what are you saying? How are you getting my attention? What do I need to do? In Acts chapter 3, there's a perfect example of how the disciples simply saw needs and filled them. If you want to have a purpose for your life, here's what God would say. Just find a need and fill it. They come across a man on their way to prayer who is lame, and he asks them for money. And the disciples say to the man, we don't have any money, but what we do have we give to you. They were listening to God. He got their attention. And then what did they do? They said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up. And they helped him to his feet, and this lame man suddenly was able to walk. There was a miracle. It attracted people's attention, and that was the day that 2,000 more individuals were added to become followers of Jesus. They simply saw the need, and they filled it. They saw an opportunity, and they seized it. Find the need and fill it. That's a great way to go through an open door that God has provided for you. This was the work of the church in the book of Acts. We're living in Acts chapter 29. There's 28 written chapters. The 29th is what you are writing, what you are living out, what God is working through your life to be able to accomplish. And so, to ask God, what are you saying to me? How are you getting my attention? What am I going to do about it? I believe that people are way more interested in how you care for your community than in anything else really about you. Our worship services, no matter how good they are, people care what you're doing for them. And I find it quite fascinating that you at Life Church, um, that back in March, you not only gave away $500 a worth of food, not $5,000 worth of food, you guys gave away $50,000 worth of food to your community. Pastor Derek shared with me how, how people came and as he gave out food, he asked, could I pray for you? And there came a point where people are actually showing up just to receive prayer. That's pretty cool. 
and not just March, but you did that again in April. And over a hundred families received food from you. You know what? In a day when people wonder what the church is all about, you're showing them. You're showing them what Jesus can do through disciples who simply want to re revisit their affairs and to follow through on their commitment to follow after Jesus, to be able to live that out, to find needs and fill them. And you know, the world can be changed in incredibly simple ways. As a pastor, I had the privilege of inviting Tommy Barnett. Uh, from Phoenix, Arizona, to come to Edmonton and to share at a conference that I was hosting at our church. And I always remember the story uh, that he told. He talked about a day when a woman came to him for counseling. And as they sat in his office, she explained to him that uh, she was feeling really down, that she was feeling really sad. She felt like she was on the edge of a nervous breakdown. Can you help me? And so Tommy said, I can. Um, I want to encourage you to go home and I want you to make some cookies and I want you to take them to the old folks' home. And uh, that day, uh, she was pretty mad. She got up, she left the office. Um, Pastor Burnett saw her later at church, a little while later, and he asked her, how's your nervous breakdown going? And she said, I canceled it. He says, oh, what happened? She says, you know, when I left your office that day, I was so mad, I went home, but then the Holy Spirit got my attention. And he said, you know, you should bake those cookies. So I did. And I took him to the old folks' home, and my life was changed. You know, inside a, a gift, a cookie can make a huge difference. A cookie could change a person's world. A cookie could change somebody else's world, because that's what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about to be able to do, to find a need and to fill it. So friends, again, the privilege of being able to share with you today, I want to close off in a prayer and to just pray into your lives. And if you ask your question, okay, Pastor Bob, what's the thing that I should do? Well, I really want to encourage you, three questions. Be a disciple who makes disciples. You can be a disciple by asking those questions. God, what are you saying to me? How are you getting my attention? And what am I going to do about it? When you ask yourself those questions and you follow through in the power of the Holy Spirit, that's what changes the world. So I like to pray with my hands open. Could I encourage you today where you are just to open your hands up, let me lead you in a prayer, and uh, just to allow God to work in your life by the Holy Spirit in this moment. Dear Jesus, I believe what you say, and I've heard from you today. Uh, you're calling me to be your disciple, to respond to your commands, and so I open up my hands as I open up my spirit to you to receive your grace into my life, to receive your Holy Spirit, the gift of the Heavenly Father. Fill me today with your Holy Spirit. I thank you for hearing that prayer and for answering it and for giving me the power to be your witness, both in deeds and in words. And I want to live for you. And so I believe your very best for my life, for my family, and for people around me. So I thank you, Jesus, and I pray this in your name. So be it. Hey, I'm Pastor Derek. And I'm Pastor Shanga. And thank you for joining us here at Advanced Church Online. It's our hope as a church to help you deepen your relationship with Christ and strengthen your faith. And we would love to connect with you. And there's a number of ways that you can do that. You can email us, you can text us, or you can comment below. And of course, you can always visit our website to get more information about us. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.